Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, DeWanda Wise talks to me about not just embracing uncertainty, but loving it. I'm very much a type A personality. I want to know what we're doing, when it's happening, and who all's going to be there. But I'm at a place in my life where I have a lot of balls in the air, and I have no idea where they will land. Closing the Dear White People chapter of my life last February was incredibly thrilling. The uncertainty of what was ahead, however, terrified me. Thanks to my work schedule, I was basically forced to take a break, one I thought was unnecessary. But as someone who loves what I do, I was just uncomfortable pressing pause. And the truth is, I needed the rest. With me today is actress and all-around badass, Dewan Wise, and she loves uncertainty. She actually taught herself to love it. I remember training and just thinking to myself, oh, I will have a better experience and I think I'll have more longevity if I can teach myself and my body how to like and enjoy the things that are kind of unlikable. I'm just a master reframer, honestly, just to be completely transparent. And in our Sankofa moment, Dewanda tells us about who she'd choose as a best friend in another realm. It was very clear that she poured her all, you know, into her work and and that the overlap of her art and her life was so deeply embedded and enmeshed. And yeah, we would have been, we would have been besties for sure. Hi, Dewanda. Hi, Ashley. (laughs) It's always a love fest with us. Very thankful for that. (laughs) Me too. So here's my thing about you. You're someone who, to me, comes off almost like mysterious, which (laughs) when you get to know you, you're the most open book. You're not (laughs) mysterious at all. I think it's just I'm an introvert. I think introverts naturally come off as mysterious and the way that my brain works and moves, it always seems like I'm thinking about something that I'm probably not thinking about. Like the director I'm working with right now, I'm playing a mean girl. So she's always like, are you making fun of me? And I'm like, no, I'm literally thinking about Trader Joe's or I'm thinking (laughs) about some dumb cat video I just watched. So you say you're an introvert. Mm -hmm. Are you extroverted at all? I am. I am definitely, which I didn't realize. I I think I got this from my dad. I know you have a beautiful relationship with your dad. I do too. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things about you. But He's an outgoing introvert, and I didn't realize it until well into adulthood that he has this capacity to extrovert, to like go out, to make sure that when he's at work, he brings his best self. But his preference and his happy place is solitude. It's in his house. It's in his man cave. It's on the computer. It's just in the kind of beautiful, majestic mundanity of life. And we just have that in common. I love, I love real life. I love making a good meal. I love being home. I'm always trying to get home. (laughs) It doesn't matter how much fun I'm having. I'm always like, what's lit though? My house. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let's talk about home. We're both Maryland girls. Yes. What do you still carry with you from Maryland and your upbringing? Personally, community was always everything. I think that It's always a matter of hindsight, but I didn't realize the extent to which it was just integral, integral to who I am, integral to my upbringing, how uncommon perhaps it was, especially in a kind of modern day context. I just, I was never lacking in community, whether that was like school and extracurricular or my mom, she's a lay minister now, but she still goes to the church Mm. that I grew up in. So there was like church community. I was in NAACP in middle and high school, the youth and college division in Maryland, which was big. I was always surrounded by community and had a degree and a level of support that, you know, I just, not that I I don't think I took it for granted. Like I was grateful for it. I definitely assumed that everybody had that. Mm. And then other than that, professionally, I think because Maryland is such a, it's a small, but a vast state, right? You have all these kind of like people from all different backgrounds. You have the city, you have rural, you have the Eastern Shore. So you have like your beach vibe. And because of how vast 
it is and how many different industries and different kind of people, the understanding I had that it means something different to be from Baltimore mm-hmm. than Silver Spring. It informs the specificity of my work. I just really respect where a character is from. I think it means a lot and it makes a difference. I've always felt like that too. Uh, I always think it's interesting when it's not included in a character description. And I always either ask or I make it up for myself because it does matter. That's what makes us also interesting is where we're from and who we come from. So... Talk to me about your parents. You mentioned that something you really love about me is how close I am to my dad, which I am. And anyone who knows me knows that it's Bernie and Ash. Like, that's my dog. We're both Sagittariuses. We just get each other. You're really close to your dad, I'm hearing. But talk to me about your parents and their influence in your life. I'm super close to my mom. My parents divorced when I was five. And I was always a little grown up. So it wasn't a disruption that I didn't welcome. I remember being four and being like, these two Mm. people don't belong together. (laughs) And so when my parents separated, it felt more like relief than than a fissure. And also in the process, I gained my stepmother, Carol, who I call Mama Two, who the combination of my mother and my stepmother, because my mom had me really young. How old was she? She was uh, 20. So she had my brother when she was in her teens and me when she was 20. And at that point, you're just watching your mom grow up. Like, we're still growing up together. Me and my mom are growing up together. We're learning things now. You know what I mean? We're, like, looking back at family history. We've always had a really close, like, daily conversation close kind of relationship. My mother was such a protector in ways that I appreciate as an adult that I obviously wasn't even thinking about when I was a kid. I was just really sensitive and she wasn't Mm. judgmental of that. She would just let me do my own thing. I was like wearing what I wanted to wear early. I was just, I had a lot of freedom as a kid. And my dad, super traditional, very much so providership was his like, was his job. And in terms of time, I spent every other weekend with my dad. And then when I was a senior in high school, I, in my, again, grown womanhood (laughs) at 16, decided I should live with my dad so that I could give myself a little separation from my mom because that's how close we were. I was literally like, if I don't do this, if I don't give myself my own mental and emotional gap year by living with my dad, I'm never going to leave the state of Maryland. I knew that about myself. So I got to know my dad a lot more. And I just think genes are wild and it's really crazy and incredible how much I'm like him. Yeah, genes are wild. I I recently had an epiphany that I am literally becoming my mother. I always felt Mm -hmm. like my dad was like my twin, but low-key it's my mom. On the lowest of all keys, it's Cindy. Like, my mom has influenced me in ways that I don't even think I realized. I just think it's so beautiful how the older we get, just the more grace we give those who raised us and sacrificed so much for us because there comes a time in our lives when we start doing that too, so we have more perspective about it. But also, I think it's cool that you had that type of perspective and discernment At a young age, it sounds like. Even just for you to say, you were four, your parents, you were like, yeah, I think they should have gotten divorced. What is this, (laughs) Dewanda? I don't know. I wish I did. I really do. It's really, I don't know what it is. I definitely, I'm very woo. I'm sure that's pretty apparent through my Instagram. But as I was raised Christian, I don't believe this is my first Mm -hmm. lifetime. I do not. There's too much that I think and I feel. I was also like, three and a half, four, when I first expressed an understanding Mm. of God or the infinite. It was like, I remember being home and just like, just saying to my mom repeatedly, like, I want to go home. And I just, (laughs) Margie was looking at me like, why is my child so creepy? (laughs) Just that understanding that this isn't all, like, this isn't the end all be all. This isn't it. I just had that super young and And I think the core of my artistry is a deep love 
for humanity, what it means to be human, the human experience, even the like mucky, messy parts of it. There's a level of like distance that I experience in my own life. Very like James Baldwinian sense of just bearing witness to myself, to my friends, to life to human beings. And yeah, I always had this kind of like watchful distance. Pretty creepy. But that was also something that I didn't realize wasn't, not everybody was like, oh, had that until much later. yeah. It's special. And I believe in past lives. And now going back to what I said initially, I think maybe that's what I get from you. I think when I said mysterious, even though, again, in knowing you, I know that you're not, but I think that's maybe what the feeling is. It's that who you are is because of who you've been. Does that make sense? And I think that's yeah, really cool. It is. That's impressive. It, it just is. My manager, she got me this like numerology reading and it was so affirming and so accurate. And it just gave me permission to live in like that kind of capital P purpose. We're storytellers, we're filmmakers, but that's not it. That's not the end all be all of the capital P purpose, you know? And I'm super clear on my purpose, which makes me super clear on the stories I want to tell and and when something is mine and when it's not. I'm very thankful for it. What is your purpose? It's multifaceted. One, it's to bear witness and to continue to be a mirror, both to my friends, to society at large. It is a natural healer. And I think in recent years, that's something that I recognized. It doesn't have to, I don't even have to do anything. (laughs) It's not something that I like have to become super codependent about. It's a natural facet of my work and the work that calls to me and that the stories I tend to tell. And I am in the same way, organically a disruptor because I've always had a sort of macro point of view. I was always a kid who asked why. I was always a person who questioned naturally the status quo. Partially, that's just experiential. I was a bit of a like Marilyn cliche, like super working class. My mom, we didn't have a lot. And so I actually, I had to question systems. Like I had to ask if certain things were necessary. You saying part of your purpose is to bear witness. That is powerful. That's really powerful because to bear witness is a very insular space to be in, but also it requires you to not have to say anything. I think that that is really deep. And so I want to know what's something that you've witnessed that changed your life? I'd say right now, funny enough, I'm reading Bevy Smith's book, Bevelations. And even before I wanted to be an artist, I was like watching E! True Hollywood stories. Like I soak up True life. autobiographies. Diary. Yes. <laughs> I soak up books. I soak up like documentaries. And so whether the proximity never really mattered, there are friends who I can think of where something so simple has changed my life. There are so many moments. I'll I'll give one specifically. You know, one of my closest friends is a novelist, Wayatu Moore. And she was always so immensely self-possessed. Like I met her when she was 16 and she just had this clearly God-given and from her family sense of self and regalness. And we went to NYU. So we went to school in New York City and we would like be walking down the street and there would be the men cat calling and she wouldn't flinch. I just never forget it. I mean, she always wore heels. She's a Texas girl <laughs> at the end of the day, Liberian by way of Texas. And she would like just be walking down the street in heels. And it was like she wouldn't even hear them. And I just remember at that age in my insecurity and trying to figure out who I was and the alienation of being in one of the like richest cities in the world, coming from where I came from, all that. I just remember bearing witness to her and being like, I don't know what that is, but I want it and I'm going to work towards it. 
Mm. Just as I've just continued to get to know you over the years and just even just now during this conversation, I've realized that what's always kept us connected and why I've always felt very comfortable with you is because I felt you bared witness to me. Whoever you encounter, you take them in honestly, uh, genuinely, and that is such a rare quality. And I think that's why I've always been like, no, that's my girl, because I feel seen at all times by you. And I hope that you feel seen by me. I mean, it's an honor. It's a, I do. Such an honor. And I think I would rather for sure live in an experiential place of that level of o- mm. overwhelm almost than closing myself off to not seeing people for real. What I never got to tell you was that seeing you play the lead and she's got to have it truly at that time in my career made me realize that I can do it too. Like 1,000%. I really felt like I saw myself in you. So I just want to say thank you. Does that keep you going in a way, knowing that just you merely going after your dreams inspires others to go after theirs? Of course. And I think because we are in it and we know the nooks and crannies, we know how much it takes, not to get into this too much, but women on the other side Mm. of the paper bag tests (laughs) who don't fit the parameters of how much more effort, fight, energy, resolve, resilience, joy, how much it takes to not only crack through, but continue to quote, I'm putting this in quotes (laughs) for those of you who can't see it, make it in this industry, how much it takes. And and then to do that and to do it with your soul Mm. intact. Yeah, it means, it means a lot. It means a lot both to have someone bear witness to that because I know that you know in very real ways, but also to hopefully continue to just keep cracking it wide open. Just keep cracking it wide open. More Black women heroes, more Black women leads to the point where it's just not even a conversation. Yeah. And I just feel so, and I know you do too, I feel so grateful to be in a position where we can keep cracking the doors wide open so that other people can walk through. It's so much bigger than us. This is about legacy. This is about making sure the doors are cemented open. They're super glue, gorilla glued open. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's yeah. The, the actually, the doors are off. Let's just take them off. There's no, there's no doors. <laughs> there's off. no walls. We're just all walking freely and living our best lives. I'm going to go a little deep. You spoke about doing all of those wonderful things while trying to keep your soul intact. So has there been a time that you felt like your soul was unraveling? And how did you get through? Ooh, that's a good one. That's so funny. I love that you asked that because there's so many phases. There's like early in artistry, my 20s, there was a level of sacrifice that I didn't even register a sacrifice. I just took it as oh, that's just what you have to do. I have so many friends whose Mm. couches I slept on. But what's fascinating about that time in my life is it wasn't, it didn't feel how it felt later. So I I wouldn't even qualify the kind of early grind as soul-sucking. I think what many actors and artists experience as that is deeply depleting is like when you enter into it a little bit and something happens and you become a bit more disillusioned. Your question actually makes me think of like 2018. I had just finished season two of She's Gotta Have It. It was very hard. We shot in two months in three locations. And I really haven't talked about this a lot and I probably still won't, but a lot of that season wasn't ready. I had to make a lot of revisions. I was basically playing producer and co-writer and so many things myself. 
And right after that, I worked on a beautiful play, but it was extremely depleting. It was basically like me pouring my soul out for 90 minutes on stage. And that was also very hard, which was hilarious because I was super romantic about it. I was like, oh, I'm going back to the theater. It's going to be great. And every system is a system. So I was still operating in the system. And then I had this added kind of very fascinating thing where there were members of the crew there who had already decided that I was just Mm. the girl from TV. It didn't matter how soft I was. It didn't matter how tactful I was. It didn't matter. I walked into the process and they had already decided that I was a diva from television. And so those two things back to back were so soul exhausting. And one of my closest friends is director Darnell Martin, and she said it so beautifully and so succinctly. And she said, it's because you have been required to be a warrior when really you're a shaman. Oh, wow, I just got chills. And that's what it was. And that's when I was like, oh, I I am soft. I am wildly soft. I am wildly vulnerable. I need to honor that. I need to do my best. This is not always possible, but I need to do my best to ensure that I am entering into work scenarios that I'm not talking about coddling, but that aren't toxic, where the well-being of others is at least a thought where the machine of capitalism and commerce is never so strong that it overrides humanity. And I just spent time after that healing, like deliberate, intentional time healing That meant my physical body, because the play was like wildly depleting. That meant a scientific study, funny enough, of what brings uh, joy. That meant returning to some practices that I had lost along the way. Very simple things Mm. like coloring, like some practices that I just let go of. Uh, That meant reconnecting with my friends. It meant slowing down. Dewanda, who you are a shaman. That just got me. And the reason it got me was is because earlier in our chat, you called yourself a healer. And then through everything you went through in this difficult time, you had to start healing. You had to start going through the healing process. Yeah. And so what does the healing process look like for a healer? It's different every season. Mm. It's different every season. And I think it's about honoring which season you're in. I've had a therapist since 2019, and she's a tremendous Black woman, of course. She's a tremendous Mm -hmm. part of my healing journey, notably because she believes in tools. She knows I love homework. (laughs) Me too. So I love an um, assignment. I just love it. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) that's a huge part. As much grief as he's trying to give me today, I've always had pets. And pets are tremendously healing, Mm -hmm. grounding. Community is always huge. I love going back home. I love like visiting my friends in New York and doing nothing. Like having sleepovers, just being in their presence, being there for them. Like witnessing in the last several years, all of my friends who have had littles, you know, and Mm -hmm. being on TD. It meant returning And it means to me returning again and again, especially because as actors, you're always lending yourself over to someone else, another story, another life. It means returning again and again to your own sense of authenticity and being so present that something as simple as making a meal or lighting a candle or standing in the grass brings you joy and contentment. Mm. It means contentment in knowing what that means for you. Okay. We don't have to get into the specifics of what happened with Captain Marvel. But what I do want to know is now that you're out of that situation with not being able to do it, 
Have you seen why? Why did it have to happen? Here's what's wild. What's wild is I knew why then. I knew why in the moment. But I also am an an adult enough to understand that two things can be true at the same time. Mm. So you can have an understanding, but still be given information that's important information. So I think in the in terms of a career why, it's very clear. Like my character in Jurassic is a pilot. <laughs> yeah. And I, Dewanda, am very much well like, I don't need to do things twice. I'm just not, I don't believe in, I, after I did Someone Great, the number of Aaron yes. adjacent characters that came my way. I was they like, do that. Once they do something, they're like, you have to do all of the same thing over and over again. And as actors, we're like, no, we want to have a varied, <laughs> versatile career. Yeah. What? I get yes. it. It's so funny. It's so bizarre. So in, in terms of that actual, like, I knew that nothing that is meant for you will pass you by. And in the, like, bigger picture of it, too, I think I thought at the time, and I still believe, like, Lashana Lynch is Mm -hmm. incredible. And that was her destiny. Like to do to do Captain Marvel, then to go on and become 007. Oh, she was so good. It's such a good movie too. And that's like a a beautiful thing when you know that even when something is seemingly for you and it's this bear, like you almost had it, but then like slips your grasp, that is still, it's still God. It's still God. I'm with my present agency because of that announcement. For sure, that announcement alone was like, oh, huh. And so I I could still feel the disappointment at the time, but also recognize that that role wasn't for wow. me. Wow. And if we look at it, yes, it was that was not for you. But if the goal of doing an action major studio film was the goal, you're still doing it a couple years later, but it's happening and it's going to be huge. It's literally, I would say, one of the most anticipated films (laughs) the past decade. At least, no, seriously. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. So when that came across your desk, were you like, oh, wow. Did it hit you in that moment? Oh, the process of it is what I want for all of us. Legit. It's what I want for all of us. It's what I want for all of us. I got an email that was like, oh, Kevin Trevorrow wants to meet with you. And we met on some like rooftop hotel in LA, like downtown LA that I found, <laughs> pretending I'm a cooler person than I am. And he was just like, I want you Wait, to come Wait, what? Hold on. Don't want to back it up. The director mm-hmm. wants to just have mm-hmm. a chat. And you sat down at this fancy L.A. hotel. And he was like, hey, Tawanda, I think you're great. Do you want to be in this movie? Yes. Yes. It happened to me twice in a row. It happened there. And it happened with fatherhood. And I was just like, oh. And it's not an expectation I have now. But I do feel like if there is evidence in your filmography, on your resume, that you can do the job, why? Why take us through all the hoops? Why? For what? Mm, Wow. It was clear from that moment and everything about it, even in the wild difficulty of shooting during, you know, pandemic, I never lost sight of that sense of of magic. Magic. First, let me say, that is the most, one of the most inspirational things I've heard in my entire career. Trust the work that you put into the world. And watch how the opportunities come to you. Yes, sometimes we have to, quote unquote, grind it out, right? But everything doesn't have to be that way. We are worthy of receiving things with ease. That is a mantra I need. Yes, we are worthy of ease. I am worthy of ease. I I am am worthy worthy of ease. 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 (laughs) Woo! Like, everything doesn't have to be a struggle, Man, wow, wow, wow. Mm. Okay, but in the spirit of magic, I think one of the most magical things I've ever heard is how you and your lovely, amazing, talented husband, Alano, how you all came to be together. Now, you've shared Mm -hmm. the story many times. In the crux of it, you guys met. It was a whirlwind romance. And what was it, three months in? Three months in. Three months, yeah. You guys said, I do. That's it. We met, said, oh, you're my person, and then we got married. So this (laughs) is what this tells me about you. 
So I was thinking about it. I was like, why is this so fascinating to me? But specifically in relation to you, and I figured it out, this is what it is. You and Alano getting married after three months of knowing each other and dating one another tells me that you inherently trust yourself. You trust your decisions. You trust who you are. You trust where you're headed. You trust your purpose. You trust your destiny. Where did you develop that type of trust? Where and when? And can you give me some pointers, sis? Listen, that's something, oh, I'm so glad. So there's this fantastic passage where Bevy Smith talks about when she was 13 and she was like, trying to be cool, trying to hang out with the popular girls in middle school. But she just realized that for high school, she really wanted a fresh start. And she was like, I need to get away from these mean girls. So she knew what high school, this is very New York City public school, like school system or whatever. But she knew what school that they all wanted to go to. So she decided in that moment at 13 that she was going to go to this other school and basically start over and be a new person. And she cites that as the moment where she started to build her own self-trust, where she started to make those, you know, decisions for herself and her life. And my, similar to everything that we've been saying, but it was just super early. Like the side effect of growing up with a single mom who kind of like lets you do your (laughs) own thing, (laughs) who kind of just lets you like bop around and figure stuff out on your own is The tools of building self-trust, it's super simple. It's essentially taking risks and making choices and those choices working out. Now, sometimes when the choices work out, it's clear, it's obvious. It's, oh, look, that turned out great and this tangible reward came from it. And the other half of things working out can be, oh, that didn't quite work out, but I learned this lesson or I gained this wisdom. And I needed that to continue to move me forward to the next thing. So I have been doing that for a very long time. I remember being in second grade and convincing the music teacher to change the age for choir so that I could be in choir. I remember going and asking that, making that request and giving my like arguments, like walking in prepared. I was seven, walking in prepared, being like, here's why you should do it. And then he was like, okay. And it was the first, I think if I could go back to my little, my version of Bevy Smith's origin story, it was that. It was always just asking for things and not allowing my feelings to be heard if the answer was no, but just saying like, I don't know, the answer might be yes. So I've always been both into risk-taking physically, like scuba diving and jumping out of planes and all that kind of like extreme sport type things, but also in terms of my career and my personal life, I think there's just a sense, a natural sense of I might as well try. And there's nothing, there's no other way to build self-trust than to just go like, I might as well try. I don't know. See yeah. what happens, you know? But- What I think is so interesting is that thriving in and being really comfortable with uncertainty is very difficult for me. Very Mm -hmm. difficult. I'm so type A in that way. I got to know what's going on. I got to know how it's going to go down. I got to know who all is going to be there. I'm very much so that person. What I want to know is what is appealing to you? about uncertainty? I think, one, I had to condition myself to, or I felt like I had to. I remember training and just thinking to myself, oh, I will have a better experience and I think I'll have more longevity if I can teach myself and my body how to like and enjoy the things that are kind of unlikable. Like I remember reframing. I'm just a master reframer, honestly, just to be completely transparent. I remember thinking like, okay, I'm going to learn to love auditioning and think about it in this way. Think about it in terms of this is my offering. This is what I would do for uh, a character. And even in that simple restructuring and reframing of 
the purpose of auditioning, that sense of, oh, this is an oppor- a number of things. This is an opportunity to perform. This is, I'm doing everything that I want to do as if we were actually filming on the day. So then I have no regrets. And it tumbleweeded into something bigger, which is now if I'm auditioning for something and it doesn't go my way for whatever reason, I go, if they don't want to do it the way that I would do it anyway, then I don't mm-hmm. want to do it. So that's part of it. Part of it was just a natural, this natural sense I had of, I know I'm walking into this industry that is so transient, that's chronically uncertain, where uncertainty is just around every corner. I am definitely like you. I need to know all the things. I need to know who's in room. I need to know. I like to know. So channeling that sense of, type A into what is in my realm of control, like being a leader on set. But then in terms of the industry at large, just knowing that so much of it, especially because what we've chosen to do, there is there's so many pathways in this industry. Yeah. You could easily be like, okay, I'm going to be on this show that's going to last forever and it's going to be dope. And there's a level of stability and certainty and security in getting a job like that. That's not what I'm looking to do. So I feel like because that's not what I'm looking to do, I don't have a choice, but just get my nervous system together and learn how to flow, forgiving myself when I'm not flowing, Mm. like forgiving myself when type A valedictorian Dewanda like freaks out a little bit. Because she doesn't, because she's like frustrated and doesn't know what's going on. So there's like that process of forgiveness if I ever feel like I step out of my integrity. And yeah, I, I think the practice of thrusting myself into these, like, whether it's like a new physical, some other form of like, exercise or whatever that I just venture into, there's something about these kind of external practices that continue to give me permission and also experience to keep taking risks and to know that it's okay. Like, it's beautiful that Mm. God is in control. It's actually freeing, like reminding myself that it's actually, thank God that I don't have to have it all together or know or be the end all be all. That's Dewanda, you are dropping so many gems. You're talking a lot about self-awareness. And I just think that that is such an important quality to possess, just being self-aware and kind to yourself as often as you can. So tell me, what has been your takeaway from our conversation? One of my takeaways is that I miss you and I can't wait to see you in person. (laughs) And it's so interesting. And tell me if you feel this way, but... You know how you're doing press and they're just like, what can people expect or what do you want people to take away? (laughs) And you're you're like, I don't know if I want to police it to that extent. I'm always so interested and I am honestly interested in hearing how things like resonate and land and don't with people. So we'll see. Again, that just speaks to the spirit of who you are. Like... You love the uncertainty of it all, but oh, no. I do. So I'm gonna tell you what my <laughs> takeaway is. <laughs> I got one the show. My takeaway is that being a master reframer is a <laughs> powerful tool, and it's something that I'm now going to really work on. And here's why: I, I struggle with uncertainty. But what I'm realizing, even as you were talking about reframing, I like surprises, though. Mm. So if I reframe that, if I don't know, then that allows me to be surprised. And that... Absolutely. Like, I'm just beaming. I'm just smiling because I'm like, now I'm like excited. Okay, it's cool. I don't know. Because then that means that I'm just going to be surprised by whatever it is. So if I like the surprise of it all, then maybe I'm okay with the uncertainty of it, too. And I need to explore that. Yeah. So thank you for, (laughs) I'm excited. (laughs) So thank you for bringing that out of me. But I love you, Dewanda. I honor you and I thank you so much for being here. (laughs) 
after the credits, why Dewanda is besties with the first woman to bring Black drama to Broadway. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is a production of OWN and LWC Studios. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lentigua. Its senior editor is Verilyn Williams. Sound designer is Cedric Wilson. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Assistant producers are Lauren Francis and Michelle Baker. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you do, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one. So clearly, as we spoke about, you've been here before. Uh, you have many a past life. So who from history do you hope or just know that you are best friends with? Uh, Lorraine Hansberry. Mm. For sure. We were definitely hanging out. I've even going to school in New York City and being there, I just feel like we were just like, just chilling, you know? So tell us about Lorraine. For people that don't know who Lorraine Hansberry is. So Lorraine Hansberry wrote uh, A Raisin in the Sun, which, um, yes. you know, historically was quite radical at that time. Um, just such a like wildly um, unexpected, human, uh, true, like <laughs> like every everything about that story at that time and the disruption of it was huge. But I think, you know, not many people know that she was a queer woman of color and just the extent to which her artistry and her focus, she wrote like two or three plays, like it wasn't much. And I always mm -hmm. identify with that sense of quality over quantity. You know, I, I don't think I ever envisioned myself as, a, as an artist who would just be like, bam, 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 bam. These might be famous last words. I'll keep you posted in the next couple of years. But, you know, she was just, it was very clear that she poured her all, you know, into her work and, and that the overlap of her art and her life was so deeply embedded and enmeshed and... Yeah, we would have been we would have been besties for sure.